Hello and welcome to another episode of the Performance Car Podcast. My name is Scott Newman, Associate Editor of Motor Magazine. And my name is Dylan Campbell, Editor of Motor Magazine. And in the back recording this as ever is Josh Robinson. Hello! Now today we're in the Mercedes AMG C63S, which Dylan really, really likes. (laughs) (laughs) So it's a 4 litre twin turbo V8 in this car, which hopefully you know, it's been out a couple of years now. We've got 375 kilowatts, 700 newton metres, 7 speed automatic gearbox, rear wheel drive, and 154,900 as standard, so a bit over 150 grand. This one has a few options on it, it's a bit more than that, carbon ceramic brakes. So Dylan, my first question to you is, if you were allowed under Australian law, would you marry this car? <laughs> um, I may commit mechophilia with this car <laughs> if I was permitted to do so and it was socially acceptable too, yes. I see. Uh, so, why would you want to marry this car? What do you like about it so much? Um, this car has a really nice interior, it's got a thumping, awesome grunt packed V8, it is rear wheel drive and it drives really nicely around corners. Excellent, that's a good summary. And it oh, sounds awesome. It does, it sounds, sounds very good as you could probably hear from your antics a moment ago. Yeah. So, before we get on to this car specifically, let's talk about the C63 a little bit in general. And you can probably hear the road noise in this car. Mm. We'll, we'll, we'll get to that. So this Mercedes has been building fast sedans for ages now. I think it's their 50th anniversary this year, but they've been building you know, fast sedans for about 30 years or so. But they really began to take off when they introduced the C63 was the last generation small fast sedan to take on the M3 and they took their their baby C-Class and stuck a massive big 6.2 litre V8 in it. So what are your memories of that car? Um, I remember it uh, yeah, having heaps and heaps of grunt, sounding awesome, um, just even at like at low speeds driving around, it had that sort of like thumping almost Messerschmitt style V8 burble to it. It just felt like a really tough um, bad car, and I liked that a lot. Uh, yeah, heaps of grunt, real drive, very friendly car to, to, to drive around in. Has a massive amount of attitude. Yeah, it is. It's a mean car. Uh, I like a, that. Even at even at idle, like it would just idle past, and you'd know because it would go. Yes. Yeah. Burble past. Yep. Uh, it was interesting that the C63 changed quite a lot over its over its lifetime. I mean, initially it had. 336 kilowatts, 600 newton meters from that 6.2, and then you could get a performance pack with a bit more grunt, gave you an upgraded engine. But like the early cars, for instance, like didn't have a limited slip diff in them, it was an option and stuff like that, so it was still this kind of cruiser, but then towards its life it got updated a couple of times and steering was a bit sharper, suspension was a bit sharper, you got you know better tyres and better brakes and stuff like that. So it changed into the sort of hardcore performance sports sedan, which was quite interesting and then the coupe came along as well so and then the the end result of that was the 507 which we both drove a little bit so was there a favorite moment you had from your drives in that that previous car Uh, I think it was the 507 wagon so we had the we had the estate for a little bit and we did a comparison with the Audi RS4 a couple of years ago now and um, just the getting out of the RS4 the with, with of course a screaming V8 all drive into a sort of more of a menacing burbling V8 and, and rear drive. Um, I remember driving around that car and it was almost like revelatory how friendly it was. It was such a such a friendly <laughs> car. It didn't have a lot of rubber on it, but it was so playful. The yeah. only problem was they took the limited slip diffs out of the C63 wagons, yeah. which was just such a crime. Because mm. if any car needed, if any car needed two driven wheels hooked up all the time, it was that, it was that 507 yeah. wagon. Um, the only thing with the 507 was that they put those nostrils in the bonnet, which I personally didn't like very much. Mm. I wanted the engine, I wanted all the upgrades, but I wanted a regular bonnet on it. So I drove, I had this, the C63 wagon performance pack, mm. which didn't quite have as much grunt as the 507, but I had that for about a week uh, when it came out, and that car was just, it, they could have had my name written on it. It was just so perfect. <laughs> I just loved that car so much. Mm. But given we were so fond of that car, you know, we both loved it, there was a lot of conjecture when this car was being talked about as coming out mm. because AMG was going turbo, we were saying goodbye to that amazing 6.2 litre V8. You know, it was gonna, it was inevitably gonna change the car and there was a lot of worry about how it would change the car, would it lose that magic? So what were your, I guess, expectations or fears 
when you first heard about this car and on its release? Oh, I mean, I was worried. Going from a, a 6.2 litre V8 to a 4 litre V8, like, are you serious? Such a massive downside. Especially turbo. Turbos kill response, turbos kill noise. That's right. And that was that was like, uh, particularly <coughs> the noise was such a big big part of the previous generation car's personality. Uh, I just thought, oh, I'd have had to really peg my expectations back about, about this car, so. It was, um, there was a lot of expectation about it and I was lucky enough to go on the international launch of this car so I was one of the first people to drive it and as we now know thankfully our fears were unfounded mm. because this car is a monster. Yeah it's amazing what AMG has done with the engine in this car and it's sort of like they've proven that uh, turbocharging doesn't necessarily have to mean you kill the, kill the noise of a, of a say a V8 in particular. Not at um, all. And it, you don't have to give up any grunt in fact you get more grunt. Exactly yeah you get more grunt than you could ever possibly handle but that's probably the key key point is that this car sounds probably as good as it ever has if not uh you know some people there was a crispness about that uh about that old 6.2 but this car has so much aggression i mean the engine is absolutely the heart of this car yeah that's right i mean this a c63 would not be a c63 with a v6 no no that's very true that's very true so as we've said you really really like this car so Tell us a little bit about what really does it for you. I mean, when, when did you first drive this car and what sort of were your first impressions? I think the first time I drove this car was at Motors Performance Car of the Year. Okay. Um, it may have been before that, but that's the memory that really sticks out to me. Uh, we had a car there with the carbon ceramic brakes. It had the uh, Michelin Pilot Sport Cup 2 tyres on it, really grippy. Probably not appropriate for a luxury car, but uh, exactly the kind of tyre we'd have on our car. And it felt so good. I remember driving it up a twisty road um, and it had the grunt, um, it had the, the chassis felt really good as well, felt really tight and nimble and agile and accurate. Uh, the front end felt amazing and yeah, it was just so enjoyable. That's interesting, you bring up the cup tyres and that's when we're, we perhaps differ a little bit because I would not have the cup tyres on my C63 and you would. Why would you have the cup tyres on your C63? Why would you tick that? And sorry, I'll just explain for anyone who's not aware, this car comes with the option of Michelin Pilot Sport Cup 2 tyres which are very, very focused rubber. They're sort of track, fi track focused rubber. You'll find them on a 911 GT3 and a Ferrari 458 Speciale. Cars that are really, you know, built to go round a circuit. So to have them on a luxury sedan is a little bit unusual, although it's getting a li little bit more common now. So, and Dylan, why would you have that tyre on your... Well, in a sense, they're terrible tyres. They're very noisy. They, they sort of, um, they make the ride even bumpier in a car. Um, they don't work particularly amazingly in the wet. They sort of, like, guarantee the safe passage in the wet, but that's about it. But it's that whole, like, 90-10 thing. I, I'm I would happily give up give up a bit of uh, comfort and refinement 90% of the time for just that that magic feeling the in that remaining 10% of the time, just the amount of grip that they have and it's sort of like the um, the amount of information you get through the tyre is just it is absolutely it's so hard to to explain it feels so good. That's it's very true and when when those tyres are warm and when they're hot, the amount of grip and precision you have in the car even a bit, you know this is a reasonably heavy car it's about 1650 kilograms. Mm. It's yeah, it's amazing how hard you can push, and that's the thing. You push, and you get a reward from pushing. You're not then managing the tire. You yeah. then, but for me, they they are tricky because they do. They are. I think they're stiffer in the sidewall, so the ride does suffer a little bit, and they are a bit noisier. And for me, also, unless they're really sticky, they can be a little bit snappy as well. They go quite suddenly when they. So I prefer the sort of more progressive feeling and the slightly softer edges of the regular tyres. But, I mean, that's the beauty, I suppose. They give you they give you the option of what you want to do. Yep. So, well, there's an interesting story. Actually, at Picotti, we were at the top of Mount Buffalo doing some photography. Mm. And it started to snow, which was fantastic. Because someone, i.e. me, then got the joyous task of driving the C63 back down, <laughs> down the mountain in the yeah. snow on cup tyres. And it was fairly eventful so any yeah. gear wheel spin it would happily give you so an exciting car yeah absolutely <laughs> so you've been driving this car around now for the last few days for the for the weekend so what are your takeaways what sort of what are your impressions and what what do you like what maybe don't you like so much um, I love the way it sounds um, with the exhaust exhaust button pressed it sounds really good at idle it has a nice burble um, even around town it just sounds good all the time that's a good point isn't it like this car is always on a little bit. Like it always reminds you yeah. what you bought and what you paid for. That's right. Yeah, the car broadly always feels very taut and it feels like a performance car all the time. 
whereas some other cars they could dial right back to a very comfortable almost passenger car uh, but this this car the c63 you're always aware that you're in a performance car and a lot of that has to do with the ride as well um, and it's we have we, we speak a lot about the ride in this car um, and I think that 85% of the time it is it is satisfactory kind of thing yeah. But you very rarely think to yourself, the, the ride in this car is nice. Yeah, exactly. I mean, I've written it in reviews before. It's it's a firm ride. You're definitely aware you're in a performance car. But for me, I think for some people it wouldn't be tolerable. I think people who came out of maybe a C55 AMG, maybe yeah. the older style class of Merc, would get in this car and find it um, a little bit bumpy. Mm. But I think given the performance this car offers you, and if you go in with your eyes open, expecting that hardcore performance car, it'll be okay. Because it is still reasonably, it soaks up enough bumps. Mm. And, you know, we're driving along a freeway now and you know, it's not, we're not jiggling about it at all. It will soak up most of the undulations, but you know, around town, tram tracks, that sort of thing, speed humps, you do get jolted around occasionally. But like for us, it's, you're willing to, you're willing to make that compromise, as you said, the 90-10 thing, you know, you, you can deal with the ride because you get the amazing performance. Yeah, it's just a funny thing that so many people buy these cars and they, maybe they don't use the performance of the car. Yeah, exactly. That's a, if you're not using this performance, if you're buying this because you want a pokey Mercedes, mm. uh, I mean, it's interesting that this was, a, you know, almost the first, one of the first cars that came out for Mercedes AMG. Mm. No longer a Mercedes Benz C63 AMG, and I feel a bit sorry for poor old car, but Carl Benz, he's mm. been, yeah, he's been forgotten a little bit. He's been cut off the name. Yes, but um, it's very, you know, it's they've taken the car very focused, very performance oriented. So if you do want this to be, you know, if you want a big cruiser, maybe this isn't the car for you. Yeah, I think so. If you're going to use your car as a daily driver and you don't think you're going to take it take it to the racetrack or take it on twisty roads that much, then you're going to be living with a, a very focused performance car without the sort of like the trade-off of, of this amazing performance car. You're going to get all the 90 and none of the 10. <laughs> yeah, that's right, yeah. yeah. But the thing is, this car can work on track very well. Yes. As long as you... You don't need to t tick the box, but the ca optional carbon ceramic brakes, which are front only, not rear, but they come with gold calipers. So if you ever see a car with gold calipers, it's got carbon ceramics. They work amazingly well. For a car that is re reasonably heavy and amazingly fast, mm. the brakes on this car will hold up around a track all day long, mm. which is quite amazing. Yep. You know, it wasn't always the case and isn't always the case for all manufacturers. Yep. So let's talk a, bit, a little bit, bit of now about... Which, uh, which variant you'd have? Because this comes in a few, few variants. It does, yeah. It comes in sedan, yes. comes in coupe, yep. comes in convertible and wagon. Yes. So what's your ideal C63? Uh, for me, it's the sedan. The it's, sedan? Yeah, it's between okay. the sedan and, and, the, and the estate. I really love the estate. I think it looks really cool. Uh, like the front three quarter from low down, it looks really tough. Um, but I'd have, the, I'd have the sedan personally. My, my ideal C63 would be the sedan on cup tires because I'm a nong with the <laughs> carbon ceramic brakes. Uh, because why not? Yeah, so yeah. there is a... At the launch, there was a wagon. It was a C63S wagon. That's another point. We In Australia, we only get the S model. In overseas, they do a non-S model, which has 350 kilowatts, 650 newton metres, I think. Um, and we were talking about this the other day. I mean, if that car came to Australia, it would be really interesting because you'd have like a maybe like a 140 grand... C63, which would be amazing value because mm. Australian AMGs come loaded with everything. O overseas, you don't get the seats, you don't get some of the you know some of the climate control stuff, you don't get the optional driver assist stuff, um, mm. the wheels, yeah, sunroof as well, sunroof, all yep. that sort of stuff. Mm. So compared to some overseas markets, Australian AMGs are fully loaded, which means they're actually pretty good value, even though this car is about ten grand more than its competitors. But that car would be quite amazing, you know. The, to have that level of performance for that cheap, uh, that cheap, that cheap price would be a, um, quite a bargain. But Mercedes, obviously, they don't think they'd sell that many. Most people would buy the S anyway. So for me, but sorry, I, I got I got sidetracked. This is the, often the case. But at the wag, at the launch, they had an estate wagon, an Aussie wagon in Aussie speak. It was this deep blue. It was on black rims. It was just perfect. It was the car I'd have. I think it was yep. just brilliant I love that car and yep. to be able to just you know take the keys and take it for a fang was one of those treasured memories so yeah 
All cars should be wagons. All cars should be yeah. wagons, according to Josh. Says so the uh, guy with lots of gear to carry. Yeah, that's right. This is a man that drives a VW Caddy, so <laughs> <laughs> he's, you know, wagon life. For me, the coupe is tempting, though, because it does look so fat. Mm. And it is a bit sharper than this. It's got new suspension. It's got different rear suspension. It's a bit stiffer. It's got wider rubber on it. It's a, it's a real animal, that car, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. So, one interesting point about this car is that you can now dictate what settings you want to do. You can There's an individual mode here that you can um, select your favourite combination of settings for the engine, the suspension, the traction control, the exhaust, that sort of thing. So what are your favourite combination of settings? Okay, so my favourite is uh, sport mode um, with the dampers in comfort um, and then sport mode ESP yep. in manual mode with the exhaust on. Let's talk a bit about the sports mode ESP because... Love it. AMG, yep, AMG does a really good job with this car. This car could be a massive hand. We wouldn't. This is not a car you would give to somebody as their first rear driver. No, it's a funny thing. You, the, you, the people you see driving around in these cars sometimes, you think to yourself, I would be surprised to see you at a track day. Yeah. And yet here they are driving a 375 kilowatt rear drive car that is slightly unhinged I mean, in, in the wet. Car, in the wet, this car will wheel spin at like 180 kilometers an hour. Yeah, and the, uh, I was driving around in this car the other day in the wet with the electronics all the way on and they can barely contain the car. Yeah. They're sort of, they, they struggle. I say like a C63 in the wet is like a turtle on its shell. Yeah. Like it's kind of funny, but like ultimately completely helpless. Yes, that's right. And yeah. I mean, we've had uh, I've had a C43 long termer. So the C43 is a twin turbo V6 C class with 270 kilowatts and all wheel drive. And that car would outpace a C63 up a twisty road in in the wet just because of its all wheel drive system. Yeah, absolutely. A good point you bring up there, the C43, which is all-wheel drive, and we've seen AMG go to the E63, which is all-wheel drive now, with switchable rear-wheel drive, mm. would this make this car better, worse, or no different? Oh, I don't know. It's a real hard one. I think for, for more customers, all-wheel drive probably would be more appropriate, mm -hmm. particularly in the wet, where you have that extra security with so much power. Mm -hmm. And really, I mean, do you, do you think this car is kind of getting close to it, to its limit of, in terms of power output for rear-wheel drive? I think it is. It's... This car isn't overpowered, but it's almost there. It's right on the on the edge. Because it's only got, I think, 255 rear tyres, maybe 265, which isn't a lot of rubber. You know, mm. like a Jaguar F-Type, for instance, has 295 rear rubber. Mm. Um, this car will oversteer, you know, oversteer for Germany. Like, <laughs> in the Oversteer Olympics, sort of win a gold, yeah. gold medal. It's just unbelievably powerful. Um, one of the scariest moments of my life was with Marcus Marshall. If you ever... If you ever watched this Marcus Marshall, I still haven't recovered from the passenger lap you gave me around Bathurst. It was terrifying. We were sideways over McPhillamy. We were, and the, you know, the it was just a ride of wheel spin, and um, he was probably loving it, but I was shitting myself to pardon the French. Um, so yeah, it's an interesting point, and the E63 gives you that security. But if you can turn it to rear wheel drive whenever you like, what's the harm apart from maybe a you know I suppose 50 kilogram weight penalty? Yeah, oh, no, but there's something philosophical about it, isn't it? It's, it is. it's hard to get your head around of an all-wheel drive. Yes, that's right. And I think it's it's part of the C63 formula. Yeah. That's part of why it's been so successful. V8 rear drive sounds awesome, got lots of grunt, and that's part of why it's been so popular in Australia as well. Well, that's a, a smooth segue into a, how we'll wrap it up is that Australia goes gangbusters for AMGs. We love the SUVs, we love the sedans, we love the coupes, we love the... The, the, even the little hot hatches like the A45s you know the, the figure that's often thrown around is as a percentage of Mercedes sales Australia buys more AMGs than I think anywhere in the world obviously bigger markets buy more in total although occasionally we do pretty well there as well I mean um, as Mercedes Australia just once sold like 600 AMG C63 AMGs in a month which is the number you'd kind of see for like a Mazda 6 or something which yeah. is an amazing figure so why do you think Australians have such an affinity with AMGs. With AMGs, generally the a AMG brand? Yeah, with AMG, because I mean, we could say it's the V8 thing, but that's not necessarily true, because they sold heaps of A45s, they sell, you know, the 43s are selling pretty well, so. Yeah, the, the AMG brand has a lot of, uh, has a lot of sort of cachet in Australia, mm. and it's kind of, it's kind of hard to know why. I mean, the C63 has been amazing for the AMG brand in Australia, and it's probably helped to, to drive awareness of that brand and, the, and its other products. Um, but yeah, you're right, the A45 as well, selling like hotcakes um, for a car that's pretty expensive, really, yeah. is what it is. So. Yeah, so I mean, 
partly it's a good product. You know, as we say, they've they've got they load them with equipment um, to you know to try and get the price down a little bit into versus you know having to option all those all those extra toys. But I think I guess it made its name with the with the previous generation C sixty three. That was the first car that really went gangbusters, and maybe you can say that that tapped into Australia's love affair with V eight. Australia is an affluent nation now. Um, I think so. There's a lot of people, I mean, the Mercedes PR guy once said to me, the person buying an HSV GDS and the person buying a Mercedes E63 is sometimes the same person, which seems a bit odd because those cars are 150 grand different in price, but one guy is just spending more money on a car, whereas the other guy is buying more toys, you know, jet ski, boat, that sort of thing. Mm. So I guess if you are that guy with a bit of money and love your traditional rear drive V8s, this is the car... This is the car you go and buy, perhaps. That's right, and I think a lot of a lot of guys out there who would buy an HSV GDS uh, for the V8 and rear drive factor would get into one of these, and they would just would not be able to get out of it. Yeah. They would try and find that extra fifty grand, no matter if they had to sell a, you know, any non-essential internal organs kind of thing. It's yeah, it's just it, it sort of satisfies that that V8 rear drive urge very very well. This car, it just certainly does. So, what do you think of AMG? What do you think of the C63? Feel free to let us know in the comments below. As ever, you can find this podcast on our website, www.motormag.com.au or on YouTube. And you can also download it in audio form on iTunes or Podbean. So we're about to do a compare with this car. That's why we're driving it to uh, Winton Raceway. So we're going to do this, the Julia QV and the M3 competition. So keep an eye out for that in the mag or online. And as, as ever, any topics you want us to cover, any cars you want us to cover, let us know in the comments below. Hope you've enjoyed this latest episode of the Performance Car Podcast. Goodbye.